Okay, it's on live on Facebook now. But um, Kaomoku, your video is muted. We're live now on Facebook. <laughs> Hello, Vidina, my name. Hello, everyone. If you're joining us tonight uh, for the Kanaka Scholar Series um, presented by um, <clears throat> HK West Maui Community Fund. The <clears throat> um, Icona O Maui Cultural Center is co sponsoring this event. Also, um, UH Maui College Hawaiian Studies Department and the Kuwait Petition. This is our second year running. Um, of the West Maui Kanaka Scholar Series and the second time we are trying this out on Zoom tonight. Um, to call on my for any technical difficulties. Um, tonight we have on our panel, we have uh, Taika Vika Tengi coming all the way from Oahu, uh, professor at UH Manoa Ethnic Studies and Anthropology. Uh, we also have Kelmo Kapu from Kawaula, Maui, uh, director of Nai Kaneo Maui, Cultural Center, and then we have uh, Nak Kaio Nakanilua, uh, Halimua Traditional Institute of Hawaiian Male Education here tonight, and we're going to be talking about uh, Ku Return. And uh, everybody give your virtual round of applause for our panel tonight, and we hope everybody enjoy. Mahalo. Okay, we'll start with acknowledging uh, eponymous ancestor of ours. Yahu Kawakahi, Yahu Wahaiyo, Yahu Hobo Nee, Yahu Kalani, Yahu Yahu Kaili Moku, Yahu Keolowa, Yahu Kalana Mai, Yahu Keolowa, Yahu Keolowa, Yahu Keolowi Hamihai. Yahu Moku Hali, Yahu Kumu. And speaking of Ku, I'd like to hand it over to Professor Kamika Tenga. Mahalo, in Aikane, O Maui, Ohana Kapu, Amena Poya Pau, O Kea Wahi, Malu Lele, Mahalo, Kono Ana Yau, Mia Mako, 
e kuka kuka ana e piliana ya aku. Um, just to extend my my aloha and mahalo uh, to na aikane uh, HK uh, West Maui Fun, the UH Maui College, and and all who have sponsored this, um, especially the Ohana Papu and um, welcoming us here, um, and then all of the kupa of this aina kulo lele. Um, for myself, um, I think uh, I just wanted to touch on a few points uh, that I've been thinking about ever since first joining the, the Hale Mua, the, the Hawaiian men's group at Kao Nakane Mua, um, along with uh, Sam Ka'ai and, and others helped to establish, to reconnect uh, Kane with, especially in that aspect of Ku which uh, many of us had felt was, was missing maybe in our own personal lives, uh, mm -hmm. but also had seen it missing in the Ma Hui. Mm -hmm. um, and the way to address that, to bring that back, to, to return Ku to our, our La Hui um, and to our, our Kane, our men especially, was through, through Aha, through, through ceremony, uh, the ceremonial practice and conduct, uh, which then also would help to instill koa, that aspect of courage and, and bravery within our kane in order to to ko'oku, right? To to make our lawfully stand again. Um, so those are that's kind of a summary of, of the comments that, that that I'll have, and I'll I'll start off with um, by way of kind of my own journey in this. So I had, uh, I'm originally from Maui, I grew up in Uwaibu, and then had gone away to uh, high school in Kamehameha as a boarder, and then off to college, um, Dartmouth in New Hampshire. And then when I came back, um, before I went to graduate school, I was, I was looking for a connection with, with the Hawaiian community. Um, and it was uh, Rick Bisson at the time, prosecuting attorney, now judge, uh, who invited me to be a part of this group of guys, the uh, Nako at the time was, was the name. And I was like, well, who's this? And seen videos on a of these guys and Malo and Terry EA. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to do. Um, and then I got there and, um, you know, it wasn't just about being the biggest badass out there, but really thinking what is your kuleana about as, as a kind what, what is it to, to take on that kuleana, to, to put on a malo and, and to carry an ihe, but not for the, the fighting, the violence, but to restore that that ea, that 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 life, that breath of our la pui, and especially those aspects that are related to pui. So there's going to be, I guess, a lot of different definitions of pui. I think a lot of people kind of only think about pui as the, the God of war, which is partly the ideas that we have about warriorhood and even my own self at that in those early days, thinking of just the fighting part. But who has many facets, and I think I'll let Kyle talk more about that when it's his turn, because he named a number of those different uh, kinono, those manifestations of ku. Um, but one way of thinking about ku, um, one of the four major male gods uh, was the, the aspect of um, industry, work, um, and certain male or, or, or Hawaiian kane essences um, about generation, regeneration, and creating that kind of mana that's also been described by people like uh, a good friend of mine, Kale Nuhiva, and the folks at the Papaku Makabalu. Um, is thinking about who as as elevating and uh, upward movement, right? Who means to be erect you know, and to rise. And so, if we're thinking about our lahui rising, and especially for our kane, where who is about that male aspect in balance with hina, right? How how do you reconnect with that? Um, and a lot of that with the the, the first it was called nakoa, the, the group that was about courage and warriorhood, and then became the Halimua, the, the men's house, uh, the, the sacred sanctity of, of, of kapu, um, of ritual and of the practice um, was to, this is again, put it into practice through the actual learning and doing of 
Hawaiian things and through, especially through the, the ceremonial aspects, which was the, for us, the major one was going to Pu'upohola, our, our temple of state. And um, that's, that's, I think, where I first got to meet Ke'e Ho'opu. Um, and as our two hui would go um, to attend those yearly Ho'opu Ikai ceremonies um, and stand as, as courageous ones um, to help honor Unui Akea there at that hail um, through AHA, through, through ceremony every August, uh, which is part of our reclaiming, reconnecting with that, that history of, of our traditions of ceremony. Um, so I went on later to uh, get my, my degree in anthropology, wrote about uh, all of those activities um, in my dissertation and then later my book, uh, Native Men Remade, where I was thinking of, through a lot of those dimensions of how Kani today in particular are, are reclaiming a lot of this um, aspect of Ku. Um, later on, I also was fortunate to be a part of a Bishop Museum exhibit that actually reunified the last major key um, or carvings of Ku that were standing most likely at Ahu Ena Heiau um, in Kona, um, the, 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 the first, I guess, capital of the, the nation under Kumehameha. And those uh, last three images currently, one being in the Bishop Museum, one being in London, and one being in Massachusetts had been separated at least from the you know, 1800s. So bringing them back in 2010 um, was a major event. It was that other kind of returning of coup and, and also the mana of coup, right? The, to, to interact and to rebuild the nation. Um, 2010, the, the 200, the, the bicentennial uh, marking of when Kamehameha had unified the islands. Um, it was also an important time because there was an Aha Kane, a second gathering of, of Kane. And, um, as uh, people trying to rebuild through exchanging ideas and mana um, at a Native Hawaiian Men's Conference. Um, and it was also the year that Kuhola, after it had been kind of resting after an earthquake had damaged it and ceremonies had kind of ceased where the ceremonies were brought back there again. So there was a lot of Ku that, that happened that year. And in, in thinking more about the legacy of the coup and the ceremonies that were held with that ukalepa, the, the standing of those two images. I think we, I would say that a lot of what happened there fed into some tremendous growth within our Lahui and it played a big part in, in thinking about what the role of a coup and ceremony has to offer for everyone, not only for Kani. Um, and one of the easiest examples I would say is, is looking at the Mauna movement where ku kia imauna has become a new manifestation of ku mm -hmm. and has really united the lahui in, 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 in new ways. And of course, here in Maui, we, we have similar struggles for our mauna, kaleakala, and really the, everywhere around the lahui. And we saw how the mauna movement inspired the, 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 that uprising, the, the ku ana of the kia i at kahuku, um, and, um, and, and everyday acts of who, right? So I think it's an important um, time to be thinking about that, and which is why um, I also wanted to have both uh, Kyle and KL who share, because I know that they're the kinds of guys who do the everyday practice of who. Um, and so I think I'm just gonna stop there and hand it over to somebody. You want me to go? Okay, so uh, for me to, to further uh, build upon what Professor Tengan has just discussed, what, what I had done at the beginning of this is to acknowledge that ancestor of ours called Ku, and there were many of them. And these were the names that they became. If you look at all of the names that I've mentioned, they're really attributes that humans like us can aspire to. So for example, 
Ku Paike. You take that name and you break it down a little. Ku Paike. So Ku, the ad. Ku in the ad. Ku Koi. Ku in the ad. Pa to strike. I the technique and K in a curved fashion. So if you look at the use of the axe, it's not like swinging an axe this way. It's more like chipping away at whatever it is you're doing. So if you're working on a standing tree and cutting it down, that's a cool energetic. That's a cool activity. Those are cool ceremonies. So if you look at the ads, it's held upright in this fashion. And you chip away at the standing tree like this. So when you see the ads doing this action, and it strikes the tree. That's pa aike. That's the technique of, of using this ads to fall the tree. Now in carving out a canoe, you're basically standing and the tree is lying. And that pa aike is done in this fashion. The technique is the same. Uh, it's just done in a different in a different realm. So that is an aspect of ku. There are many more aspects of ku. So here's the thing: for a lot of us, you know, we're reclaiming the things that our ancestors owned, and one of those things is ku kailimo which everyone calls the god of war, which is fine. That's one of those aspects. But if we listen to, to Sam I discuss it, it's really the prime minister of the state or the state of affairs. If you look at any nation in the world today, they have a prime minister and he has duties and responsibilities. And if you look at those duties and responsibilities, that's really what Fukaili Moku was responsible for. Now, we also need to recall this. Fukaili Moku was for the big island of Hawaii. Maui's prime minister was Kukio Weber. And Oahu's prime minister was Kukoonee Ho'one'enu is, is another interesting name too. So if you look at this as being a prime minister-like activity, to ho'o, to cause, ne, to move steadily forward, nu, to ascend to the nu position. So if you think about a prime minister and what his duties and responsibilities are, it's to move the state upward ahead and forward. So as Kavika was sharing, in the Kukia Imauna movement, you see that manifestation, that energy, that power, that mana of that wairua of ku, ne'e, just moving upward and upward and onward and outward into the rest of the Paimoku. And even going beyond the Paimoku, which is an amazing thing, yeah. Going beyond the five moku and going into the continental United States and to the various states there, going off over out into Aotearoa, into France, into Germany, into even Washington DC. Yeah. So you see that kuwa eana, that kuwa eana, that rising, that emanating, and Santa I would refer to that as ku nui akira, when it's open and it's outward and it's immense, it becomes the deity that stands in that great white light of consciousness. With that, another physical manifestation of ku and one who lives in day to day, I'd like to present the <laughs> Hey, hello, Kako. I'm Moku Kaku. And uh, I am from this Moku of Lina. Um, my 
I guess the only addition would be that I am infected by the so-called premonition of um, everything that had transpired before me. And one of those is cool. But always think of that thought when Sam Kai one day came to Oahu, and this is in the early 90s when he came to a lot of us from Oahu when I was living in Oahu at that time, saying that uh, his phrase was, we have been eating from the buffet of the world and neglect the plate of our kupuna. So that kind of stuck in me, saying that, wow, in, in so many ways, it's kind of offensive. But then at the same time, it's true. Because we've neglected so much in our society as kanaka, we forgot what those important values were was all about. And one of them is, you know, the representation of different things culturalistically and how our kane, um, you know, how, how would you put it? Like, what would happen with our kapu system in the old days if you really think about it? So I, that always been kind of a strong murmur in my mind when Sam Kai says that you have been neglecting the plate of the ancestor and and only ate from the buffet of the world. In a mundane way, I look at that as pertaining to, we have abolished our system in so many ways. So the need of bringing those values and traditions and systems back um, for me, uh, I try to apply every value that has to do with why we are, who we are and what basically started everything. I mentioned about Kukola. That was kind of the impetus for me to really understand where we are as Kanaka and whether or not we fulfilled our so-called fiduciary duties in this mundane society that we live. And it's been always troublesome for me when I was living in a world that, you know, discovering this simple idea as where is a place for counties to go. So like for my life, I've been a statistic of the state. I went from Palolo Valley to Merai and Alti to, you know, all these places that were uh, underrated poverty points. And finally ended up at Papakolea, then I met my wife in Kailua, then went to Nanakuli, and I, I kind of did a roundabout around the island trying to literally make sense of pertaining to why all of a sudden I'm a statistic under the state of Hawaii. Because, you know, if you look at it that way, that's what it's all about. It's all about Kanakas cannot pursue anything they can pursue because there is a state entity that say that we have made provisions for the, the less fortunate Native Hawaiians, that this is the route that we need to go. So that's been my kind of my path until that one day when I met Halemakua and Sam Kai in Alamoana Beach Park. And that's where, I believe it or not, I went strapped on the Mala for the first time in the broad daylight of 12 o'clock. And we did one giveaway ceremony down at the beach where like had thousands of people and we stood there naked. And that kind of was my first premonition of being erect. <laughs> <laughs> Steadfast, our joggers running by and we had nothing on but just our bear. And that was the first inauguration ceremony that I experienced by being based in this idea of presenting ourselves in front of Kukaili Moku, the heiau known as the Temple of Government Kukola. So from that, that infection just grew on how do we transfer this energy that we have as Kanaka, as Kane, really assert ourselves so people know that we here, we exist. We are a product of our, the making of our kupuna that left these simple tools for us to reminisce. And it's hard living in a society knowing that we gotta follow these rules. But then understanding purely 
that the rules are made by, you know, the presence of Anahua. Yeah, now I'm starting to understand that our life as Kanaka was governed by you know, a, a, a great divine. And that great divine opens up corridors where we can walk through, where we can accomplish certain things and different things like that. So I've, I've risen and, and I tell a lot of people that now I understand our plight. I'm just a motor somebody else driving the car. So like, like the certain things we've done in the past, um, in Oahu in 1997, we did a porch march around the island. And when we came to Maui, that's the first thing that was dear to my heart that we walk with this image around the island of Maui in 2008, resurrecting every moku. That we are coming, it's a kaapuni, we go to every moku, we come here to this moku, there's a response, and they take this lamaku from there and they go throughout the moku and do the same. Our reasons for doing that is experimental, yeah, in a culturalistic as well as, you know, kind of a paganistic, okay, some people would say. Because a lot of times when we go to a different moku that is really strong in protocol, we have to make sure that we need to apply certain things when we're going to certain areas. So 2012, we walked with the image. Before that, we walked with the Lamaku, which represented to us the divine light that would open up the interior of each moku's minds to have them a certain selves, culturally, simply, spiritually, and uh, physically in many ways, because some mokus was kind of horrendous. And we also, this past um, few months ago, the younger generation, so everything that I've done to try to manifest all these mokus to step up and getting all the moku representatives together and see how we can contribute to open up this bandanas box. Just recently, I think within the past five months, there was another walk. There was the rising of food, which was manifested by one of our Amana, Kaipo um, and a lot of the next generation that is going to be responsible of carrying this torch. But the rising of food, uh, during the Makahiki, it took us seven and a half days to go around Maui by addressing each moku. Yeah, 197 circumference miles around Maui. And the rising of Pu, they did it in 56 hours. So the difference between the Makahiki and the rising of Pu was uh, a great task to wake up that innate ability within ourselves that we gotta do this thing because we gotta pay tribute to Pu and whatever deity that is. Um, we really, I mean, I hats off to the younger generation that I have infected with this virus of knowing that we need to do these things or else the greater beings out there will consider Native Hawaiians lost the tradition, they lost the way. And it, it, always, it always opens up a bigger kind of box to say whether or not we need federal recognition on the political side. So when I look at those things and people ask me these questions about whether or not um, Fed Rec is the route we need to go, I, I say, you know, before that ever happens, they have to prove to me that I'm not the person that claims to be. If I'm still the person that I claim to be, to assert myself in every way to make sure that I become the one that to decide my fate in my future, and that what I've learned throughout the years that the state all this time looked at us as a statistic. I, I okay that because I understand clearly our responsibilities as pertaining to what we represent as Kanaka Maori of this Pai Aina, uh, this Wahipana, this Kohawai Pai Aina throughout the state. 
And we need to be the ones to determine and a guiding tool for us is the DMT solar class. Each one represents a different uh, manifestation. And I try to tap into that manifestation. Yeah, because it, it provides me the energy to go forward in this political wreck that we live in today and how we need to adjust ourselves by living in this so-called pandemic box by addressing the important issues out there when it comes to politics, when it comes to land, when it comes to water. And most importantly, when it comes to making decisions about TV Kukuna, uh, that we need to be the ones to be responsible of where they fit still today in our society that they should be well respected and more respected today. So I think I kind of blew off my brains a little bit, but I hope everybody got uh my not always pertaining to where I'm coming from. I am who I was. So mahalo. Yeah. Uh, Are you gonna read them from your computer? I'll mute this. Can I mute this? Yeah. Okay. Um so Shardy Marshall, I hope I'm saying her name. She said, Why Massachusetts? This is not the first time I've heard Hawaiian things being there, anyone know. So I guess she was curious of the so it would probably be directed to Kyle. Um, yeah. What's the question again? Um, she said, why Massachusetts? This is not the first time I've heard Hawaiian things being there and anyone know. Why is the cool image in Massachusetts? Um, we were told the history about that. Uh, I'm not too sure. It kind of went from sea captain to rich person to rich person. And you know, all rich people stop when they get too much stuff. And it's really, um, you know, on that high end historical kind of content, it ends up in a museum. So that cool image went back to that museum as well. But I will tell you this. So the, the, the London one went back to London. The, the Boston one went back to London. But we brought those images back and we lifted them up. But when we sent them back, we kept the wailu. They kept the kino, the body of the image. We kept the wailu. And if you look at that time, all of the, the energetic movement of, of us as a people began to continue to rise upward, but more importantly, it went outward. From that point in time to this point in time right here today, there has been positive and even at times explosive movement, literally, literally explosive movement. If you look at the lava flows that came or that announced the rising of the people, the land spoke, and the people answered. And Kukia Imam blew up the game. Oh, yeah. so, let's follow up a little bit with the, from the question of why the key is in Massachusetts. Um, the, the main organizer of that whole effort was Noel Kahanu, who's also at UH Manoa now, but was at the Bishop Museum at the time. Um, and, and she's um, the one that, that I would direct some people who are interested more in the whole history of, of how all of those images got to where they are, those key. Uh, but the, the, the bigger historical connection was the ABCFM, you know, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, which were the first missionaries that were sent out to Hawaii. And again, then later on became, the, whose, whose sons became plantation owners and, Etc. Um, there was always this deep connection with New England and, and Hawaii because of the missionaries. Um, and that included uh, how certain objects would then go back to, you know, Massachusetts or other places in the New England area. Um, so the, 
other thing I wanted to point out, and you know, I see the image on the wall that is here of the return of the, the ahuula and the mahiole, the, the feather cloak and the, the helmet of colonial pu'u that was gifted, you know, to Captain Cook and then ended up in the museum in Te Papa in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, one of those outcomes, Kyle was saying all these things that came from when our, you know, coup came back to us and helped to return. Mm -hmm. um, it also set new precedents in the return of other, you know, mea vai vai, maka mai, mea kapu, you know, those, those precious things of our kupuna coming back. And, you know, one of those doors was kind of, you know, opened by those coup when they came back. And it, it really set the stage for the return of the, the ahuula and, and the mahiole and Pu, which again, both Keo Moku and, and Kyle were a part of. Um, and just, that was 2016. And just last week, right, the Te Papa said that they were gonna permanently uh, uh, transfer the you know, ownership to the extent anybody owns these, you know, but transfer the, the ownership to the Bishop Museum. So again, these things keep on coming back that, you know, these are sometimes generational sorts of time spans, you gotta kind of wait for these, these answers to the pule and, and how they keep on getting answered in different ways. Um, so I just wanted to kind of know that and then as part of the, the genealogy of the specific return of those cool. So. Uh, we have another one from our Facebook group. Uh, where is the camel? <laughs> is this from Joseph? Costa. Um, how can we replace the narrative of our sacredness and Ibi Kupuna from foreign scientists with theory from other lands and apply it to us as if one size fits all? Okay. <laughs> it's kind of a long question, but um, we got to be the ones to make determination. I mean, there's laws out there, 6E, 13300, that you know, basically it was put together by the uh, legislation on laws on how to govern for those kinds of things. So we, we need to be the one to make the shift. And I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, when Ivi Kupuna exposes themselves, there's a time factor. And the time factor is um, the first to find them. And why I say that is because the state always likes to say that they have the ultimate jurisdiction to be the ones that they, these Makamai I consider it goes under the, the total jurisdiction of them. Like for us, a uh, simple solution. I mean, we have a borough council and the borough council gives recommendations to the state. So there was an incident that happened at Puamana uh, just about maybe a couple miles down the road from here, which is within our Moku. And um, one day we found out there were two individuals that washed up along the ocean. So we, me and my wife, took a proactive approach. We went down to Poor Mana, and sure enough, there were protruding EV that was scattered all over the place. So. We did our due diligence instead of calling the coroner, calling SHP, we, we took action within ourselves. We put all uh, uh, the kupona in, in a blauhala box, wrapped it in uh, tapa, and we took it to the barrel council, which they say there is a law, anything you find needs to go to the Department of, Department of Land and Natural Resources. So we took the box and it was. Lo and behold, it was the meeting for the Maui Lanai and the Barrow Council, and we're in prison. And at the same time, my wife says, Ms. Kupuna shouldn't be left with them because now we're taking it out of the Moku where we belong. So being that she said that, then I, I at the last minute, opened up, I started writing some stuff on the paper, then I went in front to give testimony on in the building barrels that were found, and I made a um, I asked the Barrow Council to entertain a motion to recognize Nai Kali of Maui and Ahamoku Maui Inc. as a repository to all Ivi Kupuna that was found in the Moku of Lahaina. And that created a shift 
that the borough council makes the recommendations of what they see that is beneficial, especially coming from a Moku who can identify themselves not only as linear or cultural descendants, but it's, it's our Moku, it's our place. So the borough council makes a motion to recognize us as a repository. And today I hold, I am responsible of TV Kupuna that washed up along the shore. And from there, um, with the help of our Hui Aloha Aina, uh, we put together our own barrel treatment agreement. And with the barrel treatment agreement, never, never before, Kanaka would consider that we should be the ones responsible of that because we're following the law. So when we follow the law, then we actually saying, okay, well, hurry up and do the barrel treatment agreement so we can put Kupuna back in the ground. From that time, we felt that why we don't wait for somebody else to do something which is our responsibility. So we, we did that, put together a barrel treatment plan. It's a barrel treatment agreement plan. And we just finalized Mahalo to one of the barrel council members present with us, Kyle Kalilua, that they passed unanimously to accept our barrel treatment agreement. And now we're in the process of waiting for the state to sign off so we can put our living kupuna that belong in the area exactly back where they belong. So in a proactive way, if we don't wait for something to happen, it's not gonna happen. If you want things to happen that we know that they'll be in the best of care, we, we should be the ones to make the determination on how we're gonna make these things, or how we're gonna get these things forward to make sure that the law is, is kind of finite, yeah? If you understand the law to its fullest and they, and failing in the fiduciary duty to address those kind of issues, then I clearly feel that our lineal descendancy as well as cultural descendancy is enough way to go in there and say that we want Malama Kupuna because that is our responsibility and nobody else's responsibility. So we got to be kind of keen to not get caught in those tricks and traps of how politics likes to play. And it's funny, I, I say this because there's a monetary value behind it. Yeah, on the state side, not on the Ohana side. So if there's a monetary value on why these things need to be done the way it needs to be done, then somebody getting paid to making sure that our EV component is well put away. Our reasons for getting involved have nothing to do with that. Getting involved to so make sure we do what is right, what is just, what is right for the proceeding. I have a quite answer the question. And that, that way we can come see me now, and I can have two, three hours to talk about this. Uh -huh. <laughs> What do you think about our honey who are incarcerated? Do you believe in regenerative? Regenerative healing for them via cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, for our county incarcerated out there, you know, we tried many times for years to try to figure out how, especially the ones that are out there, the mainly. It's not even, they, they, they kind of been put way out there in the mainland someplace so they can, to me, it's not a way of genocide in our people. Take them from their home, chastise them from everything that connects them to Hawaii. And that way, it's all about control. So once upon a time, I was involved in trying to see that we can incorporate ceremonial rituals back in the prison. And that was kind of an opening back then to allow, you know, our Kanaka, the way away from home in Arizona and all these kind of places locked down in these prisons out there. And it was all because of one individual, if I'm not mistaken, who was from Papapolea. The father lawsuit on discrimination that Native Hawaiians couldn't practice tradition and religion in the prison. And literally all they wanted to do was, 
They are like, like I you know, rise, wake up the sun, and and have that that ihi in them to know that no matter where we stay, we can still rise up, we can still be proud as Kamaka in despite of being incarcerated. So I got involved with the church and the wardens and to try to see if um, I could go ahead and help. That, that never happened. Um, I was responsible of trying to see if I could pick like six coolers of manifested foods for one ceremony that they wanted to do in prison. So they asked me if I can take ulu, uala, kalo, uh, hua, uh, just so they can have this pani, the ceremonial opening and the ceremonial closing. And man, I never experienced so much politics in my life from the churches and the wardens of the prison saying that, why well, if you're gonna bring enough food for inmates in one block, then you gotta feed everybody, which means the whole population of the prison. So I'm like, okay, I gotta take six coolers. Who wanna help me take six coolers? So I requested, I need six cars for help me transport this and things went kind of crazy. But that's the kind of stuff that we, we, we gotta kind of iron out on how we can help our brothers and sisters that are incarcerated. I still feel for them, but it's the politics of misunderstanding of why we suffer, even as Kamaka out there. So my whole impetus and thought on how we can um, help Kokua and rejuvenate that, they, they set precedent to me. All we need to do on our side is to, to support them. Support them in whichever way we need to support them so they become personalists, not nationalists. And that never happened for me because I kind of said, you know what, I cannot have the appropriate things to, to help me get whatever needs to. So Hanali Koli out of him is from Maui. He's been to the prison many times and he's still feeds the lahui, how he always feeds the lahui. And I hope that from that, maybe we can carry on to kind of pass the Puriyama to make sure that whoever set precedence in the prisons to make sure that becomes the priority for our Kanaka that is incarcerated throughout the land. But I still hope and pray that, you know, not already taking them all away. They belong here, they belong home. And whatever it needs to take to get them home, I'm, I'm all for it. Uh, one more interesting question. Um, Smitty Q Wong asks, what does Ku have to say about Grand Wailea expanding over Hawaiian burial grounds? <laughs> what does, I know that. What does Ku have to say? So on behalf of Ku, let me say, <laughs> I cannot do that. We cannot do that. That wouldn't be appropriate. Okay. So right now, my understanding as Maui Manai Island burial committee member, that process is ongoing. There are people that have risen up as Ke'au Moku and Ui have done and have laid claim that they are cultural descendants of, the, of that area, of, that, of those Ibi. And they are asserting themselves to have that kinds of construction Stop. Now, I believe it's a it's an extension of what they already have project, but there is a, there is a thought that they're gonna they're gonna find something. They're just gonna find more EV there. I'm also aware that there are other of our people out there who are rising up and getting involved and trying to work on the hotel side of 
helping them to establish the burial treatment plan, the burial treatment, the burial agreement plan as well. So that's politics. That's um, the state of Hawaii, Department of Land and Natural Resources, State Historic Preservation Branch, variants. That's all that stuff. If you want to talk about the energy, so our, our eponymous ancestors are energetic. This, this, this cool, if you look at all of the definitions of just the word cool, you can see that it's, it's a power and it's a source of power, energy, that rises up and constructs things. Yes, there is the destructive component to it. That's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about when I talk about the cool energetic is the constructive energy force that inspires us and instigates within us that movement to kui to grasp and to to do the pa'ai ke'e and to construct things that we need to be. As Kel Moku said earlier, within his, his burial treatment agreement plan and what he and Ui had done and how they did it, they asserted their energy. They accepted that kuleana. And those are actions that are correct and appropriate, i.e., who that. I think why layout the faults rely on the whole system of how you know for one when they're required to do an archaeological data recovery and when they're required to do a cultural impact assessment. They require to do an EIS. All these kind of things is like they're already driving themselves in to one, you know, and a lot of this one protects. Because the state as well as the county still fails in how to address issues when it comes to permitting. So everything starts the the the, the ruckus and all the PDK starts. When they go inside and they file for their applications to do this and do that. And I hate to say, but you know, in a county, you know, there's always a lot of that goes on inside the yeah, how, how everything is so transparent and complacent on how you know there's there's a time factor in a window, you get 15 days to do this, 30, 30 days to do that, and when you finally get to where you're going to start talking about the addressing the EV component, you get 45 days. So the whole problem with development in itself, developers, believe it or not, understand how everything works. So it's all based on time. For us, is we want to get down to the nitty gritty on how these applications went forward before we even talk about how we're going to rectify and how we put certain things in place to make sure that we don't do this and we don't do that. All these things to some resolution or going to the legislation on fighting more bills on how we can protect, you know, these things that are set in place to make sure that, um, you know, when they start talking about EV being desecrated, the state saying that, the county saying that. For us, we're saying, Help us figure out on what we need to do for pull them back. So we like put them back, leave them alone. And if you know that you will dig more up, there is no plan that can set as a parameter to make sure that if you do desecrate them again, uh, we can take care of those kind of things. Desecration is desecration. No other way to look at it. 
So the laws need to be changed in a county, uh, in the state level too. The state needs to stop sitting on the okole to start being assertive on what we need. What the people need of that local is to put them to rest and leave them alone. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that. No question. Uh, maybe you guys can share um, what, how the attributes that you, um, you know, you, you take on and, and, and and value in your in your day to day life. What how are those? How do you use those attributes? How is it used daily? Where do you where do you find that to tie into your daily life? <laughs> okay. Um, since we're here in the Maluulu Olele, um, I'll go with one of my favorite cool stories, which actually. Mm doesn't have too much to do with um, the politics on the surface of it. So a long time ago, when Ku was living as a man in the world in Hawaii, he was married, had a wahine, they had keiki, um, and there was a big famine, right? And Ku said to his wahine, I can bring us food, but I need to go on a journey and I'm never gonna come back. Um, and so he, stands upside down, plants his head into the ground and disappears into the earth. And that spot, um, you know, the, his wahine cries upon and waters it with her tears and eventually up pops the first ulu tree. And, and it feeds the family, saving them from the starvation. Um, and also then produces keiki that the family then gives to other kanaka and, and, and helps to then feed the whole lahui and, and providing with that, uh, that substance. Um, so that's, that's kind of one of the, uh, my favorite Ku stories. The Ku images themselves were actually carved out of wood. So again, even those Kupuna who carved that, chose that wood specifically because I think of what Ulu represents with abundance, with growth, with, with regeneration, with life, um, and feeding, right? And I think that's such a critical part of who that sometimes gets dismissed and in and, and, and thinking about that aspect. Um, so I, I, I planted an ulu tree. So there's an actual material manifestation I have of who at my hale that I um, try to malama, I use, um, you know, when the, the ulus are ready and they're getting there, the tree's kind of full now. Um, and I'm able to feed the family and, and others, but also, Great relationships, yeah, with the, the exchange of, of food. Um, but at the broader level, that's that's how I see my role, I guess, in the daily life as a professor. And, and it's more a metaphorical thing at this point, like trying to feed and provide the students, the haumana that I work with, um, new ways of, of trying to think and connect. Um, one of the real you know, uh, couple projects I had the honor of doing at, at UH Manoa where I met. Um, there's a Hawaiian leadership program where um, myself and um, Noilani Goodyear Kaupua, as well as uh, Hayley Osorio have, have taken turns leading uh, called Na Ko'oko. So the students take on this identity as Ko'oko, as, as supports for the Lahui. Um, and they, these usually involve hyena-based activities um, and experiences that really transform them. Um, and the last time I did it, we got to, it was, uh, right, it was, yeah, 2019. Um, and it, it was May that I took the Haumana to, to Moku Keawe, and then we went to Mauna Awakea, among other places that we went. Um, and, you know, a couple months later, there was the rising of the Lahui. Um, and a bunch of those students, they, they went, they, they responded to that kahea, they were at Spencer Beach Park at that meeting that was held before the Lahui went up. And um, those kinds of things, you know, when you see that happen, you know, I mean, and if I could just be a small part of providing that, which, you know, I, just a small part of it, you know, this is their kupuna that are putting them on these paths and we just try to acknowledge that and, and, and open ourselves up to, to, to that mana. Um, then, yeah, it's, it's, it's letting that aspect of cool return again 
in these other manifestations, whether it's an Ulu or, or some of the kind of knowledge that they can take in and then grow in the ways. So, um, that's with me. So in addition to that, and to, your, uh, to address your question, um, I look at the Kuz, the Kani, the Ina, the Peres, the Lomos as, as, as these attributes, as these ideals, and then the ideas that come behind those ideals. So it's kind of like, for me, it's like having a policy statement. That's the ideal. And then you get the procedures, how you get to that ideal. So pick a coup. What one speaks to you? So yes, there is kuikapu to grow the ulu trees, to, to regenerate the malu ulu ole. If you're a fisherman, then pick kuula and build your kuula on the kai, on the lihi of the kai, and build your kopa in the kai one. And do the ceremony. Speak the invocation of the intention sought and link them. Cause the regeneration of the reefs and, and the ea and feed the people. So pick a cool. Pick a policy state. Pick an idea. Learn the procedures that manifest that idea and cause it to be. Naikaneo Maui Cultural Center, this place, is the impetus to grooming warriors. Uh, Facts that I have behind me is kind of an inkling to the things that we're doing here on grooming the next generations on how we need to act, how we need to react. Um, this center has been a gift in identifying uh, where we stand as Kanaka, you know, and has been the tool to passing Ike Papalua to Rahamanas on how we can transform our manifestations of physical and spiritual manifestations in Ha and in Saul and all the things that we apply, even when we uh, take on that cool manifestation when we pair up with the gloves and the chest ears and the helmets, and we just go off on the job. So in retrospective to your question, you're asking, what do we do to daily manifest? So, you know, like for us, we do this uh, identity kind of thing. Do we have a little bit of a little so that's on how that we've incorporated in this place so we can have our own realize that in the physical realm we live, there's a manifestation that occurs that turns us into the deity of the being so we can go forward understanding how resurrection actually occurs in a place such as this, by being the, the, the catalyst and waking up their unique EK within our Hamanas so they, they acquire courage, they acquire um, to be fierce. And all those, those attributes that represent that deity, this is the place where we do that. And uh, not only myself, but Olohe Nakanilua also is a parent 
Glory, how one of the ones, the laws that we have before us. To resurrect them in the manifestation of the truth. Last question. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> First of all, mahalo to all three of you for your long, lifelong service to the Lahui. Um, my question is for each, for all of you, what are your thoughts on toxic masculinity, Western colonial patriarchy, and its role in domestic violence? and gendered and sexual violence and homophobia in our Lahui and how can we use who energetics to counter it and heal our Kane who are still acting out? <laughs> so you like to solve all the ills of the world in five minutes. <laughs> I think that's not a session, but you know, you can try. Go ahead. I mean, who like go first? I'll, I'll go first since we oh, yeah. had this conversation before, and I've thought a lot about it myself. Um, you know, I, I think for me, when I think about the ways in which our a lot of our Kane have learned these these really toxic behaviors, like oh, I gotta go be like the toughest, and I, I can't show emotions, and you know, the, the homophobia that also comes with it. And our kupuna never had any issues with, with mahu, ikane, or any other kinds of practices that now are, are stigmatized. I mean, if we're really trying to reclaim what is ku, it's also about the, those aspects that are, are not about only just the, the violence, right? That sometimes people think ku is, but Again, it's all the different aspects. Um, one of the struggles that I think a lot of our body have, have worked through is how you balance this ku and the hina as far as that's part of a philosophy of, of both rua, um, which these two Oloe have, have gone through. Um, I myself haven't actually gone through any of the classes, but I know that that's one of the core philosophies is, is, is not only of Lua, but I would say of, of a lot of different aspects of thinking of what is balance and that you have both a Ku and a Hina within you and that you need to acknowledge that, that all people have both the masculine and the feminine and it's okay to embrace that and to find ways of expressing it in balance. And I think that that's the, it's a struggle because Oftentimes, when the coup gets activated, it, it kind of sometimes maybe overpowers in, in ways that could possibly be, be more harmful than helpful when you're trying to heal people who themselves are dealing with a lot of trauma. Um, and yeah, you know, I think it, it's, it's, on, it's on all levels. And it's, it's a conversation that um, when I was first thinking about it with the dissertation and the book, it was something that Kyle and I were real explicit about. I was like, you know, there's, there's a lot of concern with focusing only on the coup, then you end up just supporting patriarchy, homophobia, and really creating negative ways of being a Kane again. Um, and uh, the focus is really how do you use energies of, of standing up what is right and what is Kono in balance to, to help heal the people that would maybe see only the, the, the violence in there. Um, and so this is something that we got to talk about and, and you know, that Kyle shares Manao, but when I was writing it, at least about this in the book, it was, it was really trying to find ways of honoring and, and cultivating positive mana that's based in Ku and, and those aspects, but also being aware that it's, it's, is doing so in order to help the Lahui, is so it's doing so not in ways that perpetuate the, the toxic aspects. Um, but it's, I, you know, I, I hear you. I think there's a real struggle still that people have when they just kind of latch onto that and then it just ends up repeating a certain kind of image of the fighter, which is not what Oa is about. Oa should be about this courage and bravery. And one of the things that, that you know, Rick Bisson, who brought me in, 
shared is like, you know, for him and his family name is Nakhla, he's from the Nakhla family. He's like, you know, yeah, you know, we grew up, we thought Nakhla is just fighting that, you know, because all our family is fight. Um, but what he learned from being a part of, of Nakhla with Kyle and Sam was that it's about, it's about courage, about bravery to, to wear the model, like, like the Elmo was sharing and to stand up for your beliefs. Um, and I think, you know, you start with those steps and then you get to those, I think, those deeper, harder conversations. Okay, well, what about all this homophobia that we still have? What about the violence that is still there? And how do we start to really bring in the positive aspects of who to overturn that? But it's, it, it's a struggle, I think. Okay. <laughs> So, so you really brought up uh, a lot of categories, and and within this this narrative of cool, what seems to keep coming out within my mind is that you need to talk to his brother first. And Ku's brother is Lolo. So, so what I'm saying is that there is an association between Ku and Lolo, like there is an association between Kanye and Kamaloa. Not an exact same thing, but they are linked together. So, before you can drive on car, you got to learn how to drive a car. There are all kinds of rules and regulations that you got to be aware of. And then you got to train to drive one car. You got to know how the car operates. You got to know what it's like to maneuver, speed it up, slow it down, stop it. That comes from Lono. Lono is the great aqua, the great power of consciousness. Before you move something, you have to be aware of it. Look at the definitions that are under that word called Momo. It's about consciousness. It's about awareness. It's about bringing news to the forefront, meaning bringing information to the forefront. So there's this big cerebral process that you need to be totally conscious about before you act on it. So to speak about all those ills with Ku as the remedy, you first need to address all those ills with Mono as the opening to that. Now, within, the, within our ancestor system, it's educational system. It's, it's customs and traditions. A young male is entered in to society and begins his adulthood by going through the first rite and ritual of over a thousand years. And that ritual, that rite, is called the Ka'i and that child is dedicated to the Akua of Lomos. So he's, he's pushed into this Lono Nuiakea, this immense great white light of awareness and of consciousness. And once he grows within this light, this knowledge, this wisdom, this teachings, this awareness, then he moves in to that architectural ilk of, of Ku. And therefore, he would understand that there is Kani, there is Kani, there is Wahi, and there is Maho. So if, he if he's aware of that, if he understands that, if he understands the roles within society that it plays, 
There's no concept of homophobia. But there's nothing to fear. You only fear what you don't know. But if you know, you fear. That's about the best I can sum it up. Can we move? Well, I don't want to call. Well, you the world that I live in, I get nine granddaughters. <laughs> I don't want wife. That one day I said, honey, I like a pool, pool I like learn how to be cool. And she said, well, I go in pool. So trying to figure out where both worlds can kind of be infused together, knowing that we have the Kana side and we have the Wayne side when it comes to all fairness and tradition and custom, the way inside is not my business. Yeah, the inside is my business, so my responsibility is to bring them. But then at the same time, getting stuck, well, what do we do with the way inside? So in a roundabout way, when we go to Pukola, we have our place. We identify the importance as pertaining to why the county has a structure on how we need to apply it to, as well as the Wahini, so my Wahini, um, in a roundabout way, went through the same uh, teachings and, and schools of how we can manifest. And we also have the, the middle class, which is my whole, my, my whole life understanding what that is all about has resonated with my family. We get plenty of hours in my but we respect and we love each other. You know, if that's the way and that's the route they really need to go, then I'd rather not hear about it. I know that you, you do, but yeah, that's all fine and dead. Yeah. But I think what really resonates to me is the couple. How we apply ourselves by identifying the do's and don'ts on what one can do, like a county can do versus. The Wahini, because there's certain things Wahini can do that I cannot. But when you identify those restrictions and the couples, it kind of sets into precedence what our responsibilities would be while we grow. The most important thing is our children and how we can make sure that all the manifestations and the successes, and as well as the favor, the failures. How we need to kind of bundle all that up and to make sure that we, we bring our next generation in the right direction. That our responsibilities is to groom them accordingly, especially before we leave this earth. To know that the route we're going to be manifesting and teaching the colleagues as well as the one in the church. So that's the only thing I can add to that. Hello, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of the Maui County Maui Cultural Center, is co sponsoring with the HK West Maui Community Benefit Fund and also with the UH uh, College Hawaiian Study Department and the Kui Pukushi Pui. Um, mahalo, everybody. We mahalo our panelists tonight. We have Kyo Mokokapu, Tai Kuviku Tengi, and you also have Kyo Nakanilo. Mahalo, everybody, for joining us and stay tuned to HK West Maui. Um, also, Hui Aloha Aina will be posting up for next month and for activities to come. Mahalo. Mahalo. Mahalo.